We are in a part nine of this series. And so if you've come in a bit late, please go back and review the first eight lessons. And if the very thought of listening to eight lessons just really gets to you, we've shortened them for Monday morning messages. And so they're following behind and you can go and listen to those. But it's very, very important that you not get in too deep without knowing there's been a lot of foundation laid we're going to do a How We Got Our Bibles series sometimes. But whether it's going to be sermons or long-form videos or even Monday morning messages is yet to be determined. And this lesson, the next to last in the series, pops the lid on the way our Bibles have been read, translated, and used. Now, I think you'll find it interesting. I hope you will. And so I'll just pose a question. Who was Junia? And why did some people want to erase her? Now, if you've never heard the name Junia, well, then you are my captive audience today. You're my target. I want to talk to you. Because I get that. I always read Romans 16, chapter 16, quickly. At least the first two-thirds of it. Because it was a list of people I don't know. It's rather like going to visit people who talk to you then about their cousins, aunts, uncle, who knew a fellow... After a while, you just you kind of opt out of the conversation. In my family, you could hold our family reunion in a phone booth, um, although under 40 years old, sorry, small room. But my wife has a larger family. My daughter-in-law has a massive family that I'm not sure I will live long enough to meet all of them. Whenever they get together and start telling the stories, I don't know these people. When we read Romans 16, sometimes, well, the meat of the book is over. Now it's just a list of people. But that attitude made me lose a lot of important information. It made me miss about Phoebe that we talked about a couple of weeks ago in verse 1, who is the only person named in Scripture specifically named as a deacon. We always assume Stephen was a deacon, but he was never named that in, in Scripture. She also came and read the book to them. She was a very important person. But I just just skipped right over her. And then in all of this list, there's verse 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who've been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Who are these people? Was she in prison with Paul? It seems to be. How did they know Christ before Paul? Well, it seems that Rome had a very vibrant and active church that Paul had never visited, and he didn't know it at all. So there were a lot of people going out and teaching. Priscilla and Aquila, we know. This may be new to you, this pair. But I want to give you a study on how to not read the Bible and how to miss a point and, and and a cautionary tale about the way some people actually change the Bible to align with their views and how the community can rise up and correct them. See, that's the thing. When we find a a situation like we're going to talk about today, it would be easy for us then to say, well, then how do you trust the Bible? Well, I trust it because the community rises up to correct errors. It can take it a while, but it does. More on that later. A man by, uh, by the name of Eldon Epp, EPP, wrote a book called Junia, the First Woman Apostle. I thought I need to read that, and I did, and I'm very glad I did. He does the hard work. As a scientist, I appreciate people that do the data, and he looked at every single extant or existing, still existing manuscript that we have found, and and looked at Romans 16, if the manuscript had that portion. Some manuscripts break and we only have uh, bits and pieces of them. He looked at all of them and he made the chart. It wasn't an Excel chart, guys. It was just, it was a proper data chart. Then he implied the culture of history, the culture, um, language, all of that context into everything he found. That impresses me. He didn't approach it as a theologian with an axe to grind. And here I want to separate two things. A lot of people believe that Bible studies and theology are the same things, and they are not. 
Bible studies looks at the nuts and bolts of scripture, how it was written, how it was put together, what are the variations in it, how, do we, how did it work, and what time was it written. Theology looks at all of it and finds the doctrines that flow through it. And so they're very, very different things. We're doing today Bible studies. Epp laid out some introductory truths after he looked at all of the data. Number one, Junia was a very common Roman name. It was common among noble families, but also common among slaves who were freed by the family or who were adopted by the family. The name in Romans 16, 7 was considered a female name in the early church without exception. That may be a, well, duh, to you, but as you're going to find out, no, that's a big deal. There is no example, no instance in Greek for the first several hundred years of the church that we can find anywhere in or out of the church, secular um, population records or in scripture where that name was ever given to a man. It was always female. Three, Greek versions of the scripture continued to spell it as a female name all the way up until 1852 when a guy named Alfred changed it because he just couldn't see how that would work. And he changed it into a fictional male name, a name which actually did not exist in Greek. And he was the only one to do this until Weymouth, who joined him in 18. 92. So for the longest time, this was not in question. Let's lay out some other facts. Early translations, such as the Old Latin, the Vulgate, the Zahidic, the Baharic, the Coptic, the Syriac, all spelled Junia as a female name. English translations also read it as Junia until the late 1800s when Alfred Weymouth and others switched it. There's a reason why. Hang on. There was no historical justification. There was no linguistic justification. The name Junia never existed as a male name or a nickname. And the name Junius, which I have seen in Bibles, or Julium, those were not names in use during the lifetime of Paul or for centuries after. Then when Epp collected all the evidence and finished, he said this, quote, Junia occurs in all Greek manuscripts except for five that have a variant of another name, namely Julia. But Julia is clearly a woman's name, the most popular by far of all names in Rome. How on any scheme then did scholars get a masculine term and change it to that of a man, a feminine term, and change it to that of a man named Junius? Well, end of quote. Whoever this woman was, look at the phrase. They are outstanding among the apostles. Take a look at your Bibles. Now, your variety of translations of this phrase, because, to be very honest, the phrase is not easy to translate word for word. You have to do it thought for thought. And so, highly esteemed among the apostles, outstanding among the apostles, looked up to, revered among the apostles, all of these are pretty good translations. What does it mean for her to be an apostle or esteemed among the apostles? One would, by the way, it doesn't say esteemed by the apostles. I've had people say, well, that just means the apostles get together and they think a lot of Junia. Early Christians didn't teach that or believe that. They taught she was an apostle. She's among the apostles. Well, what does apostle mean? It means a messenger, a leader, or an emissary. Some books will say it means one sent out. There are more than 12 of them. We always think of the 12 apostles, but remember Matthias? Remember Paul? So 14 apostles are named, and if we come to here, we have to add Andronicus and Junia. Chrysostom it's a Greek term they gave him. That wasn't his birth name. It means golden mouth because he was such a great preacher. He was not known for his love for women in general and especially not for them working in the church. And yet he even raved about her. Quote, 
Greet Andronicus and Junia who are outstanding among the apostles. To be an apostle is something great. But to be outstanding among the apostles, just think what a wonderful song of praise that is. Indeed, how great the wisdom of this woman must have been that she was even deemed worthy of the title of apostle. End of quote. And he was writing in 400 AD. It was clear that by then the church still considered Junia a female and an apostle. So how did she get marginalized? How did she get forgotten? And in some instances, turned into a man. There are three characters who are mainly responsible for this. The first was Martin Luther. Do you remember the quote we had a couple of weeks ago about childbirth and Martin Luther? Where he said, if a woman dies in childbirth, let her die because that's why they're here. I mean, he was not, he was not a feminist, can we say. He was not on women's side. He translated the Bible for the Germans very much the same way that King James had the Bible translated by scholars for the English. As big a deal as the King James Version is in the English language, his version, the Luther version of the, uh, of the German, is in Germanic-speaking countries. It was huge. He followed the text of a man named Lefebvre, um, and both of them changed the name Junia into a man by changing the name because by the 1500s, they just couldn't imagine a female being an apostle. They had no manuscript, no evidence, just a presupposition and changed the name. Well, but we're not done. There were other villains here and this man, frankly, was a villain. Giles of Rome, sometimes also known as Giles of Colonna, mainly Giles of, of Rome. Uh, it's a G, so some, some people pronounce it with a J sound, Giles, but Giles is most European. He was a servant of the worst of the popes. Now, as you know, you've been listening to us at all. We're not anti-Catholics. The Catholics are our brothers and sisters, and we love them dearly. All churches have people in their history they wish were not there. All churches do. And if any of you are Catholic scholars and you know, devout Catholics, but you know your history, you also know what's about to come here. And you're going to go, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that happened. But Giles of Rome was a schemer, politician, backstabbing type of uh, Machiavellian character who served the worst of the popes giving them more power. Around 1298 uh, AD, he was serving Pope Boniface, what a horrible name for this guy, Boniface VIII. Boniface VIII was such an adulterer and has had such a low view of women that he said committing adultery with a woman is of no more consequences than washing your hands. He would just use them and throw them away. He hated women, and he loved power. This Giles of Rome helped him move the Pope from a position of religious power to greater and greater national and international power, temporal, secular power. Boniface and Giles were also the ones to put together a whole new book of canon law, all of which supported the Pope, all of which supported his power, and all of it being ex cathedra meant it had to be, uh, you, it was perfect and it came from God. Therefore, you could not question it. He, his task, Giles' task, one of them, was stripping the nuns and women teacher of the law of their power. Until that time, nuns were teachers even of men, priests and the like. Scholars that were looked up to and whose writings were embraced by the Catholic Church. Boniface did not like that. He's the one who locked down convents and had the, the sequestered or cloistered nuns that would be locked away and never see daylight or never see people again. He's the one who did all of that. Other countries, by the way, tried to resist, and most Catholic scholars tried to resist Giles of Rome, but he was well protected by the Pope, and the Pope by that time had had an army that could back him up. I am very grateful to tell you and very happy to tell you the Catholic Church does not feel like Boniface VIII today. 
and does not feel like or abide people like Giles of Rome today. But this happened. So Martin Luther and Giles of Rome helped strip women of their place in the Christian community. But a third name, named, uh, third man named Nestle, not the guy that made the chocolate. They, uh, in fact, some people prefer, prefer to call his name Nestle just to try to you know, differentiate him. He built a text of the Bible and changed Junia to Julian, but he put no notes in the margins or in the footnotes to explain what he was doing. He just did it. And it's uh, shocking when you look Junia, 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 and you get up all the way into the late 1800s, and then all of a sudden, Julian. Well, why did you do that? A scholar of that time explained why it was necessary. His name was Joseph Lightfoot. He said it's necessary because Junia must be a male since Paul called him an apostle, and only men can be apostles. Now, those of you that have taken an introductory logic course have just had to pop a couple of aspirin. (laughs) This is called uh, circular reasoning. It's also called tautology. Uh, It is arguing from your premise, uh, rather from your conclusion, rather than from your premise. It's a real problem. Uh, Most translators of the day, by the way, use the Nestle text. And so Junia disappeared until the 1970s when some new versions came along that looked at all the manuscripts and went, no, there's no justification for this. And Junia came back into our scripture. By the way, the the German version that took her out, the King James never took her out. In the King James, she was always Junia. And I give King James a good kicking sometimes. Not so much the version of the Bible, but King James himself (laughs) Um, because I, I know the history of King James, and he was, um, he was an interesting person in the worst possible way. But at least he kept the name female, and it was not fought. It was sabotage and assumptions, not Greek, not history, not manuscripts, not Paul, who erased Junia. Why did it happen How'd they get, think they could get away with it? A minor player and a large player. A minor player, we got to lay some blame at the feet of the Roman Emperor Constantine, who wanted to form the church into a controllable, conformist pattern, just like the Roman government pattern. And if you take a look at the Roman government pattern, you can see that he did install different layers of authority in the church that mirrored the secular state. He called the leaders of the state and uh, of the church, and and people say, but the leaders of the church agreed. You forget self-selection. For example, in political polls, I we don't ever do politics here, so relax. But in political polls, those are self-selected. Please remember that. If somebody calls me and wants my opinion on politics, I well, I don't answer the, the phone because I don't know the number. And others will answer and go, I'm not talking. And so it is of the people who agreed to be polled is how they should put it. Well, this is a self-selected group. Of the leaders of the church who were willing to come before a Roman emperor to help establish the rules of the church, those are the ones who came. Not the others. And in fact, there were many, Waldensians, Paulicians, and the like, that for centuries resisted all of this but guess what those men also had the attitudes of Rome about women and therefore they shut them down and the other voices those Waldensians the Paulicians and all the other they were shut down by the power of the state by the power of the sword hundreds of thousands perished because they did not agree to be a Christian according to Constantine But there was another place, another reason it changed in the 1800s. And that was the rise of biblical fundamentalism. And I grew up thinking biblical fundamentalism was established in 33 AD with Jesus. I thought that's a way to do it. The Bible is absolutely literal in every word, absolutely correct in science, history, 
sociology, whatever it is, and everything happened exactly as stated, don't ask any questions. Where did that come from? It came from people like Schofield and the like, who were resisting Darwin and resisting the, uh, the modern age where women were doing insane things like working outside the home and voicing opinions. And that had to stop. And the rise of biblical fundamentalism, the Schofield Bible is still a bestseller today. All of his notes. But here's where the community of faith comes in. It rather reminds me of science. Science can take some really bad turns. And it has. We've lived through some of those, but in history you can see many more. But then the community, scientific community, eventually rallies, gets its feet under it and says, no, this. And it moves it over. The community of faith does the same. Remember a long time ago in part one, I talked about how GPS satellites, you used to have to hit three satellites to get a proper fix on one of the big clunky GPS units that you used to be able to have. I said that we too needed three different inputs. The Bible, nature, and the church. And by the church, I don't mean its leaders. I mean the faith community. The people as a whole. Only then can we be sure that we found the truth about a matter. In nature, we find that male and female are partners. Yeah, they are very different. Very different. In most species, the male is dominant because of a couple of things. Greater strength, greater aggression, and less concern about survival. This is why men do silly things. <laughs> this is why men die early. This is why you don't hear women say, hey, Bubba, watch this. <laughs> In most species, women are more concerned with the survival of the family, the security of the family, and the protection of the family. Does that make them lesser, weaker, or in any way? Not at all. You know, if you are a man, give birth to a couple of kids and come back to me and tell me how weak women are. It is not easy. It is not, e and not just birth. I'm just, that's my shorthand version of it. In the Bible, we see that women are partners. It was women that are uh, pointed out by Christ as being partners in the faith and the ministry and supporting the ministry of the faith. It is women that he gives his greatest compliments to and by far the majority of his compliments to. It is women everywhere from sex workers to Bible students that he shows respect and love to. Almost as if he's trying to get a point across. But we see women like Dorcas that when she died, the church started going out into a spiral. Peter had to raise her from the dead just to save the church because Dorcas was the one that held him together. There's Phoebe, Junia, Deborah, Priscilla, the daughters of Philip, who the scripture says preached along with him. So what do we do? A lot of men do what Joseph Lightfoot did, and that is, well, we have to explain that away. And as a man told me several years ago here in Tennessee, when I brought, I brought up the daughters of Philip preached alongside him, he said, they only preach to women. I said, where do you get that? He says, well, they have to because of Paul. No. I hope by now you know no. Over the years, we've been taking as a community of faith corrective steps to the anti-women rules and the attitudes of Constantine, the early Romans. But those streams of attitudes have flowed through our history into Western culture. In the British culture, sorry, I've got to admit it, um, we helped enshrine women as the, the queen of the household and how wonderful women are, but they were birds in gilded cages, the Victorian age. Of, uh, yes, we laud them and we give them long poems, but we don't let them talk, we don't let them vote, and we certainly don't let them have authority. That all was part of a stream. That's not scripture. Our churches are products of our culture to some extent. You know, there are times I look at my culture and say, I don't have anything in common with this culture. But there are, to some extent, it's always been true that the world is better at evangelizing us than we are at evangelizing it. So we have to keep, stop and say, does this look like Jesus? 
Does this sound like Jesus? If Jesus was here, would he do this? And the only way to really answer that question is to know Jesus. Read the Gospels again and again and again. And if you've not done that, if you've not done the discipline of reading the Gospels over and over for six months, you don't know how life-changing that is. It adjusts your glasses. It changes everything that you see because now you hear through the words of Christ, you see through the eyes of Christ. The community is applying correctives and I'm so glad We have lost a lot of young women who were gifted but had no place to serve because men shut doors in their face. Jesus didn't shut doors. I don't believe the Holy Spirit will allow us to remain as we were. He's returning us to the early days of our faith. And just to back this up, archaeology backs it up as well. In Mendos, there is a carved pillar of a... On it is honored a prominent woman named Theo, Theo, I know he's going to do this, Theopente. She's called on the post, the ruler of our synagogue. That's not only that. There are 19 other inscriptions that have been found. 19, naming women as rulers of the synagogue. Remember, synagogue doesn't mean just Jewish gathering. It means congregation. Elder priest, or mother of the synagogue. One of them, named Sophia, is called, quote, elder and head of the synagogue of Kisamos. Inscriptions from Egypt, from the late 200s, named Pasquesquianes as an elder. It's a female name. The bishop Diogenes set up a memorial for Amian and Kale, two female presbyters. They had died. He wanted to set up, he set up a memorial in their name for what they'd done. There are dozens of passages and letters from one Christian to another naming women as leaders in the church. And one of the earliest documents we have from the early church, it's a book, short, but it's a book called The Statutes of the Apostles. It's a manual on how to organize a church. You see churches instructed to ordain two widows precisely for the task of receiving visions from the Lord and instructing the people. Did you know any of this? It's amazing. People don't know. So what should we do with this information? Well, the first thing we should do is remember this lesson when we run across a passage that seems to contradict the life of Christ. The second thing we should do is, well, whatever Jesus wants us to do. Pray to him. Talk to him. He taught us to love one another, serve one another, to consider each other as brothers and sisters, and to include each other at the table and in our mission. And as David Bates, who, by the way, was one of the first friends I made when I came to America in the late 80s and has been my friend ever since, read from Galatians, there is now no more Jew nor Greek, free nor slave, male nor female, not in Christ. We are truly one. We are not to speak ill of women or lock them down. And I probably need to say this. We should not speak ill of men and knock them down. Men are necessary. Women are necessary. While we are different, there are many things that both of us can do. And those things we should do. We need both on the planet. And remember... To keep the main thing the main thing. Eyes on Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Follow Jesus. If we do that, we will find a consistent river that all these streams can't pollute. It'll move us past the rocks in the stream. And we can make our home in a river of faith. Knowing that God gifted our sisters just as he gifted our brothers. And can some sisters teach some errors? Yes, because they're human. Men have done it for 2,000 years. I'm sure women could do that too. But as long as we're pointing to Christ, remember what Paul said. He said many preach Christ out trying to get gain. Others, he said, specifically preached about Christ in order to increase his punishment in prison, just to hurt Paul. 
And he said, I don't care as long as Christ is being preached. Now next week, we're going to deal with the thorniest of these passages in 1 Corinthians 14. And you're going to learn another thing about how the Bible was put together. It may be the hardest lesson to listen to, but I truly believe if you trust the Holy Spirit and the community of faith, it'll be a freeing one as well. But that's the subject for next week. For now, this has been an unusual sermon because we've not focused on Christ constantly and we've not looked at a bunch of passages. But we've done that for the last eight weeks to prepare for this week and I hope that it helps. Remember the Monday morning messages are also there to help you process and to help you remember. And also remember, you can write us at any time. We will do our best to answer any questions for you.